Hey, do you like samurai movies? Me too! Let's talk about Western cowboy movies. Now, long before Sergio Leone got the idea to repurpose an Akira Kurosawa samurai movie into a Western with Fistful of Dollars in 1964, Hollywood had already been down that road and to much success. Both samurai and Western films share so much of a similar mythology to their historic roles, easily romanticized and brought to the screen with morality plays. Comparisons to Westerns was a prevalent commentary by critics when Seven Samurai came out, but for good reason. Don't take my word for it. Here's an excerpt by author Stephen Prince. Kurosawa's battle epic lent itself to the Western, and Kurosawa himself was a fan of Westerns. Samurai and Japanese movies, if not in historical fact, were analogous figures of legend and romance like movie gunfighters in the American West. The Samurai and Kurosawa's film were ronin, rootless, drifting warriors like movie gunfighters who carried their weapon on their hip. Considerable mystique surrounded the samurai sword as it did the gunfighter's pistol. So even before The Magnificent Seven remade Kurosawa's tour de force into a western, the cycle of influence was already in effect, again proving that nothing is truly original and everything has already been done and we're just doing our best reinventions. That was something needed in the western genre when we get into the 1960s. The Magnificent Seven, 1960. The Magnificent Seven is the last charge of the great Hollywood studio westerns who had seen their heyday of the 1950s. The John Ford and John Wayne and Howard Hawks formula gets one last brilliant polish in this story of seven noble warriors defending a town from bandits. 1960 is considered the end of the golden era of the western. After 1960, we quickly see the Sergio Leone Italian reinvention of the genre with a more graphic and stylized, violent and uber cool version of these movies. Hollywood follows suit within the decade, and even Eastwood brings back this harsher and grittier style for his own American westerns like Hang 'em High. Sam Peckinpah was another director, undercutting the traditional conventions of the Hollywood western after the Golden Age, or at least sneaking in during the waning years. As we discussed in Chapter 1, there's a composite of characters that fit this group with themes that recur in the various incarnations. And the casting for the day was like that of a Fast and Furious movie or an expendable sequel with so many shining stars. So let's look at our chart from the last chapter. We got the bald leader, thanks to Yul Brynner. We still get a bald, charismatic leader. Uh, the old friend in this version is played by Rnav Urba. Uh, the archer is replaced by the knife thrower, played by James Coburn. The woodcutter is Charles Bronson in this version. The young kid in this version is also the farmer trying to ascend the class structure he was born into. He still has the romance as well, and he's played by Horst Buchholz, Robert Vaughn, who all happens to be the drunk. And we also get two new archetypes added to our roster. There's the fortune seeker, played by Brad Dexter. This is our first right. interpolation. All that's on top. He always has one eye on a scheme to make money and some sort of easy payday. And then on top of that, we get Steve McQueen just for extra cool points. With McQueen, we get a role that I'm calling second lead. Let's see if that's true. They're not old friends. He isn't any of the other roles. He's just as, if not cooler than Brenner. Now, there's actually a story here. McQueen's star was on the rise. The script didn't have a role for him, but the director, John Sturges, knew he would be an asset, so they wrote him in. And then during filming, it's well known that McQueen would just chew up the scenery to upstage or take a bit of the spotlight from Brenner, which annoyed him to no end, you know, just like jangling his, his spurs or smoking or just like a little bit of business to distract and get so, so, so like, but holy crap, right? Steve McQueen, James Coburn, Charles Bronson, and Yul Brynner, the kings of cool. Now let's also slide in a one Mr. Eli Wallach as the villain, which is especially spicy because in the following so many years, he goes on to play Tuco in Sergio Leone's The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. He was the ugly. And this sets a standard for American releases going forward that is nearly impossible to match. All that star power gets underscored by Elmer Bernstein's iconic music, or should I say, highlighted by one of the greatest and most memorable movie themes of all time.
There are also scenes that play directly across from each other in both movies, like when the warriors first arrive at the village and they meet the village elder and the farmers all cower before them and we see the outsider of the group, the Tashiro Mufun character in Sam Seven Samurai and the horse buckled Chico character in The Magnificent Seven who shame the farmers for their cowardice, seeing his own origins in them. Chico also has the romance in this movie, like his youthful counterpart Katsushiro in Seven Samurai. It's a little cornier, it's a little cuter, funnier. It's that Hollywood treatment where they smooth off the edges. And while it's also a classic, like Seven Samurai, this is a little more family friendly and more easily accessible for people who maybe don't want to watch a black and white movie with subtitles for three hours. For example, in the original film, the bandits take the villagers' wives and daughters for less than noble pursuits, while the Hollywood version sidesteps all of that for the cute romance. Now, before we get to the sequels, I want to mention a sort of precursor to The Magnificent Seven that came out one year prior. It's also directed by John Sturges and stars Steve McQueen and Charles Bronson. I discovered it when researching the Men on a Mission subgenre that ended the last chapter, and also when looking over John Sturges' filmography. Never So Few is a bit of an ambling and meandering war film starring Frank Sinatra that has a clunky romance in it. For us, in this video, that's interesting mostly because it's a setup or a springboard to The Magnificent Seven with Bronson and McQueen and Sturges teaming up, but the cast alone has a host of other great character actors like George Takei, Mako, Gina Lola Brigida, uh, Dean Jones, Philip Ahn from Kung Fu, and James Hong. Just a, a neat little footnote there. Okay, The Return of the Seven, 1966. In contrast to the first movie, Return of the Seven in 1966 is a little darker. Only Yul Brynner returns, but he brings a few familiar faces. The idea of a sequel to a movie where a large part of your favorite characters are killed in part one is an interesting reach. And sometimes it's genius. I'm, I'm thinking about the 1986 Transformers animated movie that killed off Optimus Prime and half their principal cast and then introduce us to a whole new slate of characters that have since been embraced by the fandom. Well, even that's a tall order when Steve McQueen wasn't killed in the first movie, but for whatever reason, he doesn't want to do the sequel. And then you have to get another guy just to do like a Steve McQueen impression. That, that's not so magnificent, right? Right off the bat. And then also, Chico doesn't want to return. So of the three characters that didn't die, only one wanted to come back. You know, I bet Robert Vaughn would have come back. It's a, it's a little Robert Vaughn humor for you. Anyway, the plot concerns the Seven reuniting to help out the village one more time, not being able to reunite the cast, but still going through the motions to try and recreate the magic of the original movie. It's a bit of a stretch. Now, the cast of the Seven isn't going to be a complete recast of all the guys that just died, so there aren't many archetypes to point to on our chart. Of course, we get Brynner back as the leader, Chris Adams. Uh, Robert Fuller plays the McQueen role, and uh, Julian Mateos replaces... Uh, Horst Buchholz. Now the rest of the characters are a grumpy gunslinger, a bandit, and a cockfighter. Each are as unmemorable as the sequel itself. None are particularly distinct, aside from Warren Oates as a ladies' man, which is an archetype that will return. So we're putting it on the list. Well, how do I know she's married? Women ain't like cattle. They ain't got a brand on her hip to let you know when you're driving another man's stock. Guns of the Magnificent Seven, 1969. Now, in the third sequel, the Seven are assisting a Mexican revolution, so this is called a Zapata Western. Yul Brynner decides not to help out and is replaced by George Kennedy. The formulas for these films are usually pretty close, so you know the gist of the plot. This time, they're helping revolutionaries in Mexico free their imprisoned leader. The group of Seven uh, aren't the most iconic, and only a few of them repeat from a free previous version or used again in new incarnations in the future. So. George Kennedy as Chris Adams isn't bald, but he fills that particular role. He's the leader. I can tell it is in the eyes. James Whitmore is the knife man. Oh, I've got guns. But nobody handles a knife like you do. But Whitmore isn't done there. He's doing most of the heavy lifting here, also playing the part of the old friend and the woodchopper. So that goes on the list. 
Joe Don Baker also serves a dual purpose, both playing a traumatized veteran as well as a Confederate soldier, which we can also add to the list because you're going to be redone again. Rennie Santoni plays the Ute. Did you say Ute? No, no sorry. The Youth. Jeez, what a stickler. And Bernie Casey plays a freed slave, and that is a character type that also comes back later, so we will include it on our chart here. Look, it's all personal taste, but I think this is a better sequel than the last. The cast is more interesting and memorable, and carries a little bit more of the spirit of the original film, but there is still just one more sequel to go. Seven here. The Magnificent Seven Ride Again in 1972. The 70s are not the 60s, and you really feel that in The Magnificent Seven Ride again in 1972, 12 years later. The Dollars Trilogy is out, and Clint Eastwood is back in America, already having made Hang 'em High. The Dirty Dozen was out. E. Van Cleef plays Chris Adams as having settled down with a knife as a small town marshal. It starts with his wife being kidnapped, and then turns into a revenge story when she's raped and murdered. He shoots two men in cold blood. You're a lawman. You gotta take us into trial. He won't shoot us in cold blood. I don't bluff. But then he gets wrangled into defending another small town from bad guys. That's a really hard turn to make from bloodthirsty vengeance to noble hero and defender of the weak. Uh, he ends up getting the rest of his hired guns from prison in one fell swoop, so their distinctiveness is less than noticeable for the most part minus the author following him around to write his exploits, played by Michael Callan, which is, I think, a fun addition. And we do get a Confederate ladies' man, played by James Sicking, filling out two spots on the chart. Uh, Ed Lauder and Gary Busey are also in the movie, though Busey isn't one of the seven. Hey, did I mention that they replaced his wife, right? I mean, I don't mean the actress from a previous movie. I mean, they kill Chris Adams' wife, and then he's hell-bent on revenge. And then before the end of the movie, he just finds a new wife, no biggie, WTF. The score that's reused seems out of place in this darker Seven movie. I mean, it should be darker too. The casting Lee Van Cleef after The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, where he played the bad, I mean, I thought that, that brings along a certain expectation for his attitude and coldness. The movie is action-packed and entertaining, but just not quite the right spirit if the goal was an attempt at the feeling of the original. The action itself smells an awful lot like it was influenced more by the Wild Bunch or the Dirty Dozen using the blood squibs for bullet hits than it does the 1960 Bang and Fall Over Dead Magnificent Seven. And this helps explain why the group of seven aren't as important as the one-man vengeance tour that Lee Van Cleef is on. Now, after this 70s sequel, the franchise rests for a while, content with TV reruns and then video rentals. But in 1998, The Seven returned with a TV series simply called The Magnificent Seven TV Series, 1998. Now, I would have thought that a Magnificent Seven TV series would be a terrible idea, but this show had a decent run of 22 episodes that leave you wishing there were just a few more. The cast is pretty sensational and is the real draw here, in my opinion. So, so Michael Bean is our leader. Eric Close is the second lead. Ron Perlman plays Josiah Whitlock, the woodchopper. He's more easily identified as a preacher type character, which I think is a wonderful addition to the roster of archetypes, even if it never really repeats. Dale Midkiff plays the old friend and the ladies' man, uh, and Anthony Stark plays the fortune seeker, which we haven't seen since the 1960 movie, and Andrew Kovavit plays the kid. Rick Worthy plays an ex-slave, echoing Bernie Casey's character from The Guns of the Magnificent Seven, so this version of The Seven pulls from multiple of the previous versions. The first episode is a remake of the 1960 version, but instead of poor Mexican farmers, it's indigenous people and the marauding bandits are Confederate soldiers now after the war. They're led by Kurtwood Smith. I think this is a great reinvention of the plot or different spin on it. Spoiler alert, they all survive. But like, 
that shouldn't come as a surprise. Otherwise, how's it an ongoing TV series, right? Well, that question's answered in the second episode where the group is deputized in a small town by a judge played by Robert Vaughn. Now, so just a reminder, Vaughn dips his toe into these magnificent waters five times throughout the series. So this is the third example, right? The A-Team, the Magnificent Seven in 1960, and now this one, and there are still two more to go. So one each in the upcoming chapters. Vaughn features in a handful of episodes, making him a recurring character, if not a regular cast member, but still a welcome addition that gives that little like nod of authenticity. The TV series is also a haven for the working actor, veterans and newcomers alike. We see Tyne Daly from Cagney and Lacey, Kurtwood Smith I mentioned, Alexa Vega years before Spy Kids, Carl Lumley, Peter Firth, Ed Lauder, who is himself one of the seven in The Magnificent Seven Rides Again, Brad Dourif, Tim Thomerson, Brian James, Bruce McGill. Like, it's pretty impressive, especially for such a limited amount of episodes. Oh, I think this is an underrated show. It wasn't gritty, cutting-edge TV like HBO was doing at the time, but this is reinventing a 1960s classic feel-good western for a new generation almost 30 years later. I think they did a pretty decent job. Okay, one more western example, and then we're going to get into our bonus homage movie, okay? Anton Fuqua's Magnificent Seven 2016. In 2016, we got our last official adaptation in the full Hollywood tradition and splendor with the budget and the caliber of cast and crew befitting a golden classic. The cast is a modern analog for its era. Denzel Washington, Chris Pratt, Ethan Hawke, Vincent D'Onofrio, Lee Byung-hung, uh, Peter Sarsgaard, and Matt Bomer. There's a rich robber baron taking the land from the townspeople instead of Mexican villagers played by Sarsgaard. There's actually a two-part episode of the 1998 TV series that tells a very similar version of the same story where the seven escort homesteaders to their new land and are accosted and harassed and murdered by a wealthy Bruce McGill. Whether it's better or worse is, of course, a subjective, and I think that Fuqua made a satisfying and solid action western, but a modern audience seems to want the action and the violence more than they want the fun. Maybe the fun doesn't work as well in a modern aesthetic unless it's overtly comedic or satirical. Maybe that Dudley do-right sensibility of the 1960s that was brought would be too hokey or corny now. That was well understood by the 70s. There's also no romance, which makes sense in the context of this movie, but again, it's not the flavor of what the original movie brought. So let's pull out our list one more time and line up our iconic roles. Denzel is the leader and Pratt is the drifter or second lead. Ethan Hawke drops in to be the most multifaceted character in the movie. He's the Confederate soldier and the traumatized veteran like Joe Don Baker from Guns of the Magnificent Seven. Martin Sensmeller plays Red Harvest, a Comanche warrior who uses a bow and arrow to deadly effect. Of course, his name is also a tip of the hat to the Dashiell Hammett story, which was adapted into Yojimbo by Akira Kurosawa. And if you want to know more about that, uh, the history of that film, you can check out my five-part series on Yojimbo. So Red Harvest is the archer, but Lee Byung-hung is also a knife man most closely associated with the James Coburn character from the 1960s version. D'Onofrio plays a religious mountain man who might be the closest to Ron Perlman from the TV series, even though they are very different characters. I don't think the movie is horrible, but it wasn't amazing either. I think it was serviceable as a remake, but it doesn't recreate the magic of the first movie, which is understandable especially in a more cynical world today where people facing overwhelming odds and self-sacrifice doesn't come without selfish motives for why would they help, you know? Bummer. Okay, now, I wanted to include an extra sort of off-topic example to highlight or illustrate just how broad the influence of this story is. In the last chapter, I gave the example of how The Seven Samurai birthed an entire subgenre of men on a mission movies, and this time, I thought something closer to the genre covered in the chapter would be fun. So, with so many sequels in the 60s and the 70s and the summer reruns on TV, it's no surprise that parody would find its way to the Seven Samurai plot. So in the 80s, we got a comedy classic that earnestly deserves to be recognized here as a genius interpolation of the story. The Three Amigos. I'm Lucky Day! I'm Ned Nidalander! I'm Dusty Bottoms, and together we're... The Three Amigos! 
<laughs> in this version of the story, the farmers look to hire their heroes thinking a movie they see is a documentary instead of a campy adventure western. The actors think they're being hired for an acting gig, and this misunderstanding is the base upon which the rest of the movie is built. Our three leads are played by Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Chevy Chase at the height of their powers and abilities. John Landis directs, and it was written by Steve Martin with Lorne Michaels and Randy Newman. The music was scored by Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein, I mean, come on, how great is that? The same guy who did arguably the most iconic Western score does the Three Amigos score. Now, while I would argue that The Three Amigos is far more than just a parody of The Magnificent Seven, we do see all the main moving parts of that plot. We get the bandits and the poor villagers, the villagers going out to hire brave warriors, the, the team's already assembled here, but there is a romance, and before they win, there is the turnaround part where it looks like total defeat and that they will abandon the town before the last act of final victory. Not to mention that they keep the entire Mexican village locale and the conceit of cowboy heroes. Now there are plenty of digressions and original content in here as well, twists on the familiar tropes. There's a great idea here where the villagers think that they can lie about the money because in the films they see the heroes always turn away the money. We can pay you 100,000 pesos. 100,000 pesos? We do not have 100,000 pesos. Don't worry, Rodrigo, they will refuse it. But it would be an insult not to offer it to them. And then ironically, and in contrast to that heroic trope, the three amigos are doing this only for the money. And of course, the entire idea of the Amigos literally doing the movie conventions and parading around with their patented soliloquies, only to face a real monster in the really real world, which of course is still a film and a comedy, uh, and as monstrous as he is, El Guapo is pretty hilarious and kind of charming. <laughs> I like these guys. They're funny guys. Okay. So that's the rundown for all the Western reinventions of Seven Samurai. Watch the next episode to see the influence of or homages from China. Please like and comment on the video. Tell me if I missed a Western version. I probably did because this story is the most remade story in film. I do seek those movies out that people leave in the comments. So please share and I will see you next time.